Welcome, everybody, to WDYT. We're excited uh, tonight. Uh, sometimes we have a guest, and sometimes it's just Pastor Jim and me. Jim and I got to spend last week together, which was a treat. I was in Tucson, and uh, we spent some time working on what we hope will be a blessing, will be uh, a set of workers' meetings for pastors around the world. So we outlined some things on the character of God and on discipleship and on leadership. And before the week is out, we had one solid invitation and appointment and another maybe. So we're hoping this will be a blessing uh, other places. But uh, we are blessed to have a guest tonight is Michael Campbell. Dr. Pastor Jim will uh, introduce him after prayer. So welcome and thanks for being with WDYT. What do you think? And we're going to try to find out what Michael is thinking. All right. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get in. Lord, our Father in heaven, I thank you that uh, we have a chance to be together and to have someone who is truly on the cutting edge, who is taking on challenging topics and writing on them carefully and thoughtfully. So we are, we are blessed to have Dr. Campbell here uh, with us tonight. We pray that many will watch and many will listen and many will learn and be blessed by what we cover tonight. So uh, give us focus, give us uh, wisdom. May all that is said be truthful and wise and bring you honor and glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Pastor Jim, well, well, lead the uh, way. It's great to have you here, Michael. And as uh, those in my family know, Michael and I go back a ways, really Jonathan and Michael, my oldest son, and he were close friends and I heard about him. Still are. <laughs> still are, yes, still are. And um, so we could go into all kinds of stories that we know, but we won't go there. Uh, he was kind enough to come to Rocky Mountain and work with the Montrose Church and did an outstanding job when he wanted some pastoral experience before he said clearly he was heading for teaching, but thought it was important to be a pastor for a while. And then in IS, when they came around saying, do you know a Michael Campbell? I said, absolutely, get him. And I really hoped that we would cross a little bit there, but I was gone to Bangladesh before he got there. And so, Michael, it's nice to see you again and always love reading your books and seeing what in the world you're up to. So, hey, Jim, uh, Dan, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you guys. So why don't you tell us about this latest book that you're writing and isn't quite published yet, but you are in the finishing touches, I think. Correct. Yeah. In fact, uh, I just got the final page proofs uh, yesterday <laughs> and the urgent appeal to please turn these around. So I uh, worked on that furiously the last uh, day or so and uh, just sent that back to Pacific Press. The book I'm working on is called 1922, The Rise of Adventism, of, of Adventist Fundamentalism. And so really it's a sequel to my previous book uh, and some of my, even my doctoral work uh, re pertaining to the 1919 Bible Conference. And so anyways, to make a long story short, uh, I've been studying a lot on the 1919 Bible Conference for, for 20 years, and what I really wanted to do was to kind of take this a step further and kind of look at the aftermath. What happened next? Kind of the, the rest of the story. And so what I, I, I've tried to unpack is um, how did fundamentalism, uh, the historical movement fundamentalism, the, this modernist fundamentalist controversy during the early 20th century, how did that shape Adventism? And as I've kind of embarked on that journey, I've been able to discover that it actually truly had very uh, a very profound impact upon the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so um, I'm, I'm to the point where I'm willing to, to argue, and I think a safe case can be made, that, that one of the most pivotal decades in all of Adventist history, I mean, you could go back to the 1840s, 18, I'm really glad, Michael, that this is the young person who's having problems with modern technology and not us old guys. <laughs> yeah, right. My just got to keep these earbuds in if I can only do that. Um, the 1840s and 1850s, you know, the, the formative stages of, of Adventism, right, or uh, the organization of the church in 1863. So there's that really early formative stage, right, that, that we tend to talk about in Adventist history. 
Uh, and then in the 20th century, a lot of people will talk about maybe like the 1950s where, uh, you know, questions on doctrine and, and some of those um, events as being very pivotal. Uh, but I would argue that uh, the 1920s really truly is as pivotal as any other uh, particular time period where Adventism kind of um, uh, changed. And, and that's what I uh, try to explore in this book. And so 1919, the 1919 Bible Conference, again, you know, you see people debating how do we interpret inspired writings? How do we debate Ellen White? What's her authority in the church? Um, and after you see a shift in generations where increasingly more and more people kind of uh, adopt a, a fundamentalist viewpoint. In fact, I, I have yet to find anybody that really opposed fundamentalism in the 1920s. Every single Adventist, significant Adventist author I can find is touting and saying fundamentalism is amazing. Uh, we are fundamentalists. In fact, some people go on to say that Adventists are the fundamentalists of the fundamentalists. And so, <laughs> uh, well, uh, what, Michael, what does that mean, uh, right? Yeah, unpack that a little bit because as you hear the history of the German theologians and how they were sort of destroying a picture of scripture that Adventists mm -hmm. held dear. There mm -hmm. was a reaction, and I would say an appropriate reaction to the German, uh, you know, th liberal theologians, and so mm -hmm. Adventists swung on this pendulum along with a whole bunch of yeah. other people. Now, yeah. why well, is and, that good, and why is that bad? Well, I'll tell you because um, the, <laughs> the devil doesn't care which ditch he gets you in, as long as he gets you off in the ditch somewhere, right? And finding that kind of healthy and balanced uh, perspective on inspired writings and how to interpret inspired writings is absolutely vital. And what I basically am arguing that when Ellen White was alive, she was sort of this balancing force that helped Adventism avoid these extremes. Now, towards the end of her life, you have people like Kellogg, who truly could be a kind of Adventist modernist with his pantheism and those kinds of things. He clearly is headed in the direction of modernism. Ellen White kind of curbed those tendencies, but she also equally curbed the fundamentalist and the rigid, hardcore uh, ways of inerrancy and a rigid and militant way of interpreting inspired writings. So Ellen White's alive. She's this balancing, mediating force. But after her death in 1915, she's no longer there. And the temptation that Adventism has is generally, at least in the 1920s, is not towards modernism. It's clearly towards fundamentalism. So in the 1920s, I'm exploring what, how does fundamentalism change Adventism? So are we going to get a one minute uh, summary of how you use the word fundamentalism? Yeah, or, and I'm, or, I'm glad or, you or asked. One definitions. Yeah, so the, the fundamentals, uh, you know, you have to really actually first define who are the evangelicals, right? So the evangelicals are the conservative Christians that go back within the revivalist heritage of America. In fact, evangelicals go all the way back to the 16th century with Luther as another term for Protestant. But in America, it has a very distinct meaning, meaning talking about this revivalism. In the late 19th, early 20th century, um, these conservative Christians, the evangelicals, um, a branch of that starts to, uh, starts to go ahead and they begin to uh, militantly react against the rise of moder modernism, historical critical method, evolution, and they want to militantly defend the faith. And so around 1910 to 1915, there's these pamphlets called the Fundamentals. That becomes the namesake for a movement that eventually will garner. Initially, it's kind of a, a tarnishing name, like the Fundamentalist is pejorative, um, but they quickly adopt that. And, and because the, they, they want to hold the fundamentals of the faith, the historic faith, you know, faith of Christianity, uh, the, the Bible being literally inspired some will push inerrantly inspired uh pushing for a literal creation the efficacy of the atonement the importance of evangelism and missions all of that are seen as hallmarks of uh, needing to defend that that the the fundamentalists see the world around them as changing and that they are under threat they're under siege and that's a big part of fundamentalism is this sort of siege mentality and the need to militantly Kind of defend the faith and so it's kind of these very reactionary conservative christians uh and you see this within uh mainstream american christianity these these this kind of bifurcation this uh a lot of denominations were split adventism was never split adventism always 
uh, during this time period from after Ellen White's death through the 1920s is solidly on the side of fundamentalism. The problem is, is how fundamentalist will Adventists become? Some say, well, and it's becoming quite popular to embrace inerrancy, this rigid and inflexible way of, you know, there's no mistakes in the Bible or inspired writings, right? And so uh, those that are saying that are also, some some are, are looking at that and saying, well, Ellen White, that doesn't really work with Ellen White because she revised her writings. We don't have, you know, if you, if you really push that hard, uh, you begin to start having some issues with Adventist theology. And that's, that's really where I, I start unpacking this. So the fundamentalists um, are this historical movement, the early 20th century, that's militantly defending the faith, reacting to uh, theological modernism in the church. And of course, fundamentalists could mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. I mean, people talk about fun radical Islamic fundamentalists that blow themselves up, right? You know, um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a specific historical movement. That's what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about fundamentalism. Do we have any evidence? Did you find evidence that there were a key Adventist scholars or a key Adventist spokesman who went and got educated? Uh, did they read a famous fundamentalist book or these pamphlets? Did they go and become a disciple of some major speaker and then bring it over to us? Absolutely. Just... All, all, of, all of the above. Although I can't say that I can think of any Adventists going to fundamentalist schools. There's there's only a few of them, like uh, Biola in Southern California, uh, maybe uh, Moody's school in Chicago, and Riley had a school in Minneapolis. So there, there's a couple of these places, but there's few and far between. They're fairly small. But we do see are these same fundamentalist leaders, Adventist church leaders, visiting them at conferences, reporting on these conferences in church periodicals, not in obscure places, but like on the front page reprinting their articles, featuring them, and then extensively qu quoting their writings. And so, in fact, I, I, the, I, I, you know, reading through the review page by page in Science of the Times through the 1920s, um, there's hardly an issue that doesn't have something that's either referenced or quoted uh, referring to the this larger fundamentalist movement. So it's, it's really uh, extensive, it's pervasive, uh, in terms of how Adventists saw themselves, they clearly saw their identity as fundamentalist. And that's why I say um, Adventist fundamentalism, because what they're doing is they're taking and appropriating these ideas within the larger fundamentalist movement, and they're adapting them to Adventist purposes. Okay, I'm going to take you from the scholarly world <laughs> to the church pew. You okay? bet. Mm -hmm. What difference does that, what you just said, make to most Adventists? Well, it makes a big difference how we interpret the Bible, and it makes a big difference how we interpret Ellen White's writings. Because if um, her writings are inerrant, and, uh, and, and the sort of proof texting method, um, I see this quite often where people take a quote here and take a quote there without examining the, the context and trying to really understand it. That proof texting methodology was quite common among the fundamentalists, Adventists began to use that kind of proof texting method uh, when it came to Ellen White, producing a lot of different compilations. Now, compilations in themselves aren't bad, but if that's the only way you read inspired writings or Ellen White's writings, then it can lead to an unhealthy theological diet, so to speak, right? So that's that's one aspect. The, the other aspect is some confusion over how people understand and interpret Ellen White's writings in relationship to the Bible. Because some people began to say, well, the Bible and Ellen White, they're both inerrant, they're both inspired. So then I will use Ellen White's writings as sort of a divine magnifying glass through which, and the only way through which to interpret the Bible. And so people began to put Ellen White's writings above the Bible. Uh, some would even say that. They'd say Ellen White's writings are scripture to me. Um, and they would even, <laughs> one of the most extreme examples would refer to Ellen White as a pope. So basically she's the infallible interpreter of scripture. So for now, the average person that, in the pew, that, that has profound implications, how you interpret her writings. Do you interpret Ellen, the Bible through Ellen White, or can you actually just study the Bible itself to learn what is true? Go ahead, Jim, sorry. Well, uh, when I was in Asia, I found that that was the position of most 
of the various missions in Asia, and that was that Ellen White was the ultimate interpreter and was equal to or above the Bible. Yeah. So, I did a fun thing when, when I was in Asia, too. We had a church where we were at, and I kept a record of Ellen White quotes the Bible text at the end of the year. And there's a good cross-section, and you know where, <laughs> what I'm talking about, Jim. Um, so we had conference union division people, even some general conference people at that church on a pretty regular basis. So I got a good cross sampling the end of the year. It was roughly about 10 Ellen White passages for every scriptural reference. And I think, it, you know, I, I don't have a problem with using Ellen White, um, even in the pulpit, but, but I think that dynamic should be the reverse. It should be 10 scriptural passages for every Ellen White passage, right? Um, and so that that you can just see in a very tangible kind of way that that problematic uh, that how problematic that is. And that's in a country where probably access to the full range of Ellen White books would be a little limited. Correct. Wow. Yeah. So then it's even harder to get that context. And the danger is, is then people develop extreme interpretations because they don't have that context. And Ellen White wrote so much that if you start taking little pieces here and there, snippets, you can begin to make her say what you want to say. And then really the authority, you become the authority in projecting through your methodology, you um, assert yourself um, upon the text rather than let, letting the text actually speak for itself. And so um, actually, I think it's a, 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 it's a disservice to both Ellen White and scripture. So... Uh lest this be considered a North American division, new kind of uh, research project. Are there other divisions doing similar kinds of research on the same time period like you are? Do you have you know, help out there researching this field? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there's not many of us trying to delve into the 20th century. There, you're right, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. There are some, there's a few, and they're beginning to work on Adventism in South America and Africa and Asia, different parts of the world, uh, but a lot more work needs to be done. And I think what you were talking about before, Jim, you know, the 1920s was the great age of Adventist missions. So we kind of exported some of these fundamentalist views overseas, um, not thinking uh, what some of the implications of that might be. So we exported a lot of good, but sometimes uh, without realizing it, maybe uh, there was a, you know, some problematic aspects that, uh, depending on the missionaries who went and and their how sound their theology was, there, you know, would leave kind of a theological legacy, you might say. So obviously, the modernism you refer to, or the modernist uh, perspective that they were fighting, mm -hmm. a different definition for the modernism that postmodernism is moving away from. It's almost a reverse, okay? Absolutely, yeah. So it's important for people to sort of understand that because what I find interesting, I wanted you to speak to this, as the church sort of moves into postmodernism, there seem to be similar trends of the church moving back into a fundamentalist mindset. So you have to think about um, fundamentalism also in a philosophical sense. Now, I, I know this is getting kind of, you know, it's kind of getting up there, but but um, what, what, what is going on between modernism and fundamentalism? You see, because both the modernists and the fundamentalists are dealing with change, and they're both confronting modernity. And there is a great need within modernity to be scientific, to classify, to gather data and facts, and all of those kinds of things. And so both the modernists and fundamentalists believe that they were kind of uh, doing a service to the church by updating it. The modernists, liberal uh, modernists were, you know, let's take evolution, these kinds of things, and adapt science in that tra trajectory to Christianity. The fundamentalists, um, in a way, they were doubling down on their faith, but they were doing it in a way uh, by collecting data and facts. And they were just as modernist as the liberal modernists, but they were doing it in a way that was trying to uh, reify their faith um, to, to strengthen it. And so uh, both were very well informed by the same modernist assumptions. They just took two very different approaches to how they reacted to those same changes going on around them. So that's kind of important to understand because, uh, you know, Jim, as you were saying, um, yeah, philosophically, we've kind of moved past that to postmodernism, now metamodernism. <laughs> and 
So these kind of questioning of these kinds of assumptions. And so uh, now we look back and we're like, well, um, what's the big deal, right? Uh, but those historical time periods, um, we can now, thanks to, you know, that's been a century since all of this happened, hopefully we can still go back to that history and learn a little bit about it and how it shaped our history through the rest of the 20th century. And that's why I find it very important. 1920s really is pivotal because that's kind of when Adventism modernizes. It becomes a bureaucracy. It becomes not just a little small church. It's a global church with uh, members, more members outside of the United States um, than in North America, right? So this it's truly becoming a global denomination, a bureaucracy. There's a big organization. It's bringing in millions of dollars uh, for missions and all of this. Uh, and uh, so, so learning this context is absolutely vital because many of the later theological debates over the past century are really informed by these struggles that took place in the 1920s within Adventism as Adventism tried to reconcile itself with its own identity. And, you know, I, I like how George Knight put it in his book, Search for Identity, what is fundamentalist in Adventism, right? It's asking that question, what part of our identity connects to, uh, to fundamentalism? And it did profoundly change Adventism. And uh, coming back to my book, that's, that's kind of where I'm trying to give examples of just how, um, how, how incredible and profound those changes really were. So to, uh, maybe this is too big a subject to um, uh, try and tackle or connect the dots. And that is ML Andreasen went off on his tangent of perfection, mm -hmm. okay? Right. They have last generation theology nowadays, okay? How do those streams of Adventism connect or do they connect directly to the fundamentalist mindset that came into the church? <laughs> yeah, so you're already approaching my third volume. Uh, so my, I'm gonna have a 1919, 1922, Eventually, I'm going to do 1925. It's going to be a, a trilogy, a trilogy. Uh, and so I had enough stuff left over from my 22 book that I finally just decided to jettison it off and, and make it a third volume. And the heart of the third volume, I'll give you a sneak preview, is I'm calling it the paradox of last generation theology because what I do is trace the theological origins of last generation theology to the 1920s. And I think this is gonna be uh, dynamite because I, no one's ever done this before, but you have in the 1920s within fundamentalist circles, what's called the holiness movement, the victorious life or Keswick movement. And these holiness teachings talk about a special second blessing and achieving Christian perfection. So they're very focused on perfection, uh, perfect characters, those kinds of things combined with proof texting you start seeing a, uh, a lot of usage of a quote in Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, taken out of context about Christ's character being perfectly reproduced. And you also see a, a brief quote from Great Controversy about God's people after the time of uh, at the close of probation who live without an intercessor. They piece all those three things together, those three ingredients, and those three ingredients produce, um, I argue, last generation theology. So I shared that with several of my Adventist historian friends. Um, I, as far as I know, no one's ever made the connected those dots before. It's there. I can document, you can see how it wasn't there before this. Um, I mean, obviously those statements were there, but they're taken out of context. If you read Christ's Object Lessons, Christ, you know, Ellen White's talking about perfection is, is character development, right? It's not about outward kinds of things. Um, and, and, and of course we don't, never, <laughs> Uh, cease to um, uh, be in need of uh, the atoning work of Jesus Christ. We we never move beyond that, right? But but Ellen White's making a certain point that God's people at the end of time are fully trusting in um, in Christ. So she's making very specific points. But when taken out of context and this perfectionistic, um, this fundamentalist uh, and this proof texting kind of methodology, it is the perfect storm for last generation theology, which I'm arguing is a heresy, right? It's a, it's a, it's, it's a deviancy. We see it appearing, making a grand debut in a big way, in a big way in the 1920s. And so, yes, um, this is, this is actually, I think, pretty huge. Um, M.L. Andreessen, 20 years later, will write his commentary on Hebrews, 
and that's usually cited as as you know last generation theology but really it was far more popular in the 1920s so he was stating what he had learned as a young pastor and that was uh, extremely popular in Adventist circles in the 1920s so um, Andreessen certainly believed it and taught it later but he did not originate it and and now we can actually historically document this beginning so uh, if this is too pol political how does the BRI react to your books yeah I you know that's a good question um I the only thing I have is is a book review but it's not from someone from the biblical research institute I've gotten quite a number of reviews from, from different people. Um, the former uh, director of the Biblical Research Institute on Hal Rodriguez was gracious enough that he wrote a, a very kind and uh, blurb supporting uh, my research. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased that, uh, you know, I think my research stands for itself. And I love when people can actually, um, you know, they can look at my research and the data and see that uh, what I argue and and um, you know if if people have other evidence they can argue with me but uh, probably the best critique I've I've ever seen uh, it's not I shouldn't say best critique but the the most uh, uh, the, the strongest critique I've seen is is someone really didn't like what I wrote in my last book and they said well because he is critiquing fundamentalism therefore he must be a modernist. And that's that's actually kind of hilarious because this that's that's just the farthest thing from the truth, um, and they don't provide any historical evidence to document that. So um, in terms of historically, and um, yeah, there have been times when Adventism has been tempted towards modernism, but not in the decade after Ellen White's death. And so if someone can show me where we have people advocating modernism, I'd love to see it. I have yet to find it, and I've spent a lot of time looking. And so the temptation Adventists have, at least in the 1920s, and I, I suspect the overall in our history in the 20th century, the great temptation Adventism has faced is that of fundamentalism. And, uh, and it, it remains that way, I think, to this day, because we exported it overseas, as you were talking about, Jim. Um, so, so these are challenges. And um, I hope to have more dialogue with uh, more friends and, and fellow scholars, uh, whether in the biblical research or um, any of our scholars. I think we need to talk about these things and wrestle with them uh, because they're serious and have real um, consequences and serious implications for how we do church and how we live our lives. Dan? Yeah, uh, Michael, I just wanted to get your reaction to this question. Mm -hmm. Uh, the older I get, I find myself doing and being what I absolutely vowed I would never be, is to be a grumpy old man, <laughs> Come uh, on now. worried about the next generation. Sure. Uh, and you all, I think you know what I'm, kind of thing I'm talking about, as I would watch my grandfather, you know, and the Benden, the Benden family, you know, just despair over where the next generation was going. Mm -hmm. But I find myself sitting in staff meeting with my young associates as they mm -hmm. challenge things. I don't think we really need to have the historicity of the stories of the Bible. Uh, one tried to tell me that guilt was, uh, was all wrong. I said, there, I said, there's bad guilt, there's some good guilt. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. No, no, all guilt was bad. I mocking evangelism and uh, switching over for the sake of uh, social justice. So the, the tension between the old and the traditional and the new goes on forever. Uh, Absolutely. And, and Chaim Potok is a famous one in the Judaism of writing that about that tension. Mm -hmm. How is what happened in the 1920s any significantly different from just that? Old people worried that uh, we're going to lose the grand landmarks and so they want to retrench and uh and hold on to things but yeah i'm guessing you'll say that there's more there's more of a landmark transition there and the battle's bigger but tell me about that yeah so i mean that's 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 always the danger of doing theology um i remember 
Uh, my good friend George Knight once said, you know, there should be uh, an eleventh commandment: Thou shalt not do theology against thy neighbor. Right? Mm -hmm. That uh, the danger is, and when we do theology in opposition, we drive ourselves to theological extremes. Right? So what's really important is that we remain anchored in Scripture and remain biblical, faithful to Scripture. And uh, the problem, I think, in 1919 and through the 20s is that a lot of people are doing theology by what they were against. So they're against the modernists. They're against evolution. So, um, and I'm not saying we should have gone down those paths, but, but the, it's equally troubling to go to the opposite extreme. So back to that where we started out, it doesn't matter which ditch you get in as long as the devil gets in one of those ditches and gets you distracted. Um, the, the challenge, the, the phenomena of change never goes away. And you're right, Dan, you know, every generation has to come to grasp with what they believe and why and how and and apply that. So change and contingency and change over time is this is what historians, this is our bread and butter, what we deal with, right? And so if we can better understand how those changes have happened in the past, hopefully it'll illuminate our present identity. And that's not to say that change isn't ongoing right now. Of course, it's ongoing. We live in a world in constant flux. Um, and so change existed 100 years ago and change is continuing to happen. Um, but I, what I would argue is that we need to remain faithful to scripture. Um, and I would also argue that fundamentalism in the midst of everything else by fighting against the modernists, they actually were adopting change and new theological ideas that were aberrant and moved Adventism away from its historic beginnings that were much more flexible and moderate and balanced and that I see really uh, modeled in Ellen White that we were kind of talking about before. So um, I'm not here to say that all these different issues, we're, we're gonna have issues. We're always gonna have issues. And another generation you know, comes and goes, we're gonna see, see still yet more issues. Um, and every generation will wrestle with that tension. Uh, but, but I think the great lesson is you know, let's be faithful to scripture and let's not do theology by what we're against. You know, um, it reminds me of, of coming, trying to make it real and, and practical, going to a Sabbath school class, right? That, uh, you know, you have two different people and they're just passionate about their topics and they have their list of quotes, but, and they fight each other back and forth. Have they really actually learned anything? Well, probably not. They've actually further entrenched themselves. And even though they may be fairly close in their positions, they've actually polarized one another. And uh, that's what I argue in my previous book in 1919 was one of the great lessons of the 1919 Bible Conference is the dangers of theological polarization. But um, uh, change can be good and change can be bad. So I'm not saying it, it, it's, it's kind of it's but it's a constant. And so we have to evaluate the change and respond to it based on scripture, not by what we're against. I think it's helpful. Uh, that's a, that I'd like to press you a little further on the being faithful to scripture. Sure. Because both both groups would claim that mantle. Absolutely. And and uh, that's at the heart of the issue is that is that each, the, the especially the, the people who are trying to hold on to something from the past absolutely believe that they are the uh, ones preserving the plain sense of, of the word. And right. that they don't want you to interpret. Don't don't bring all your highfalutin method methods to our our study. If the text says it, that's simple enough. Uh, <laughs> so when you say we should be faithful to Scripture, right? Does that really help us? Unless we go further to say faithful to certain ways of interpreting Scripture. Well, if we're really honest, all of us interpret Scripture, and anyone that's married you know, can understand this, right? You know, you go to the grocery store and you have to pick something up and you get the wrong thing and there is a miscommunication, right? Um, and so how we go about interpreting our lives, how we interpret scripture matters. And so we can say, yeah, you know, I just take it as it is, but unwittingly um, and ine inevitably people are still superimposing some kind of lens through which they are interpreting the Bible. Now that's been a hallmark of, of conservative Christians, this plain or common sense way of interpreting the Bible um, actually has deep philosophical roots and, um, and became very common in, 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 in the 19th century and in early Adventism. 
Um, but if you look at our early pioneers, they were also Bible scholars. They studied the biblical languages. They look at Ellen White's library. It's full of Bible dictionaries and Bible commentaries and Bible atlases and all kinds of interesting things. So um, if you actually take Ellen White and the Bible seriously, um, rather than just take what I impose on scripture, right? Just read a random text here and there. And then um, we have to take all of what the Bible has seriously. And we need to follow faithfully. The Bible is self-evident and self-verifying in terms of giving us uh, principles through which um, we can, you know, uh, what is termed, uh, you know, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? So there, if there's a right way of doing it, that means there's a wrong way of interpreting inspired writings. And, and if you look at Ellen White, um, especially in the nine volumes of Testimonies for the Church, one of the resounding themes is all the people who misinterpret her writings. And she has some very strong words to say about how to properly interpret uh, her writings and the Bible. So, um, yeah, we, we take the Bible seriously. And you're right. Everyone claims the mantle that they um, are, are the most faithful or, or truly understand. But I think actually the, the better and safer way to go is rather than be speaking such strong absolutes that maybe a, a, a gentler approach would be one of humility. I've got more to learn and, and the word of God is so deep. I need to keep exhausting, you know, exploring the deep treasures of the word of God. So um, that's maybe not a very good answer, but, I, you know, it's trying to explain a little bit that that um, all of us do interpret inspired writings and we do it probably in ways that we don't even realize. Um, and so that necessitates that at times maybe we should step back and say, well, how are we interpreting inspired writings to make sure that we are actually being faithful to scripture? Um, everyone believes that they have the truth um, and they correctly understand the Bible, but um, I, I, think, I think that's a little bit arrogant. And so it's much safer to say, you know what, um, I'm, I'm going to take, a, 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 my, take my shoes off, I'm on holy ground, and I'm going to search for truth as for hid treasure. And uh, that means sometimes um, there's some things, you know, like the writings of Paul that are hard to understand that take a little bit of, um, a little bit of effort to try to, to correctly interpret and make sure that you're correctly interpreting the word of God. So um, yeah, there's different ways people interpret it. And even the people who think they're not interpreting it are still interpreting it. I wish, I wish uh, either in the books that you're about to write or in a separate book, you would hit that issue head on. Uh, I can give you chapter and verse where I've seen what you're talking about. And, sure. Uh, especially in the women's uh, ordination debate before the last gen Mercy. general conference, the books came flying out. And <laughs> the very books, the very writers who said, don't interpret, don't spin, don't do anything. But when you ask them about some other verses, immediately began to interpret why we didn't have to do that and 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 somewhere we'll need some guidance and maybe now that you're going to have the imprimatur of the division with your that new position you can give us a, an authoritative book that would really I help i us. don't believe that's part of the bargain yeah but I, i'm just only wishing if you could, uh, if you could, yeah, no, they, they, that. that's not part of my job description as far as i know but if i can encourage other people to value the word of God and to make a commitment to study it. I believe God will reveal himself. And if we take an attitude of humility and an open heart, teachable heart, that God truly will help to open our eyes and allow us to be able to see um, the word of God. And um, there's, there's actually another term that's uh, just to throw out a fancy term, the perspicuity of scripture. It goes back to Martin Luther. And that's that the, the perspicuity means clarity. So it's kind of like having glasses, right? And so at Luther time, this was one of the hallmarks of the Protestant Reformation that probably <laughs> that probably the, the I, concept by Luther, people know the least, but probably one of the most important because he's famous for sola scriptura, scripture alone, and sola fide, by faith alone, those, those concepts, and they're absolutely vital. But um, the uh, perspicuity or clarity of scripture says that, you know, the, 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 while the word of God has incredible depth, there are some teachings contained within the word of God that are so obvious, they're so clear, they're overwhelming that, and, and some of those teachings are the love of God. You can't see through reading the whole Bible that God loves you and the message of salvation that Jesus died for your sins. That's what Luther is talking about when he's talking about the perspicuity of scripture. 
Yeah, there's there's things that we don't understand in the Bible. There's there's things that Bible scholars, archaeologists, all kinds of people are still wrestling with and trying to figure out. But even if we don't know every little fine minute detail in the Bible, the message of salvation and God's love and that he wants you to be in heaven with him forever is just overwhelming. And for people with Ellen White's writings, the same thing's true too. You know, people get hung up on a couple of, you know, just a handful of these very obscure quotes by Ellen White on on very minute details of say like health reform or whatever, right? And they get really worked up about that. Um, this is a handful of statements, but look at the thousands and thousands of times that Ellen White talks about God's love. And she writes the book Steps to Christ and Desire of Ages and the plan of redemption. And Ellen White was passionate about Jesus and she was passionate about lifting up the word of God, the importance of the word of God. And so I think if we're really faithful to inspired writings, both scripture and Ellen White, and the way I understand Ellen White is if we're really faithful to her, the more I read her, the more I want to be more like Jesus. I'm challenged to be more like Jesus. And the more I read her writings, I'm challenged to be uh, to dive in and be faithful to scripture, that I need the Bible in my daily walk with Jesus. And I think that's a healthy and balanced approach. That's what I see is the overwhelming, that's the perspicuity of, of, of these kinds of things, the clarity that we can see that's obvious. And, and so we shouldn't lose the, 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 the individual trees for the forest, the, and the overall forest is, is the message of the gospel. It's the message of who Jesus is and what he means for you and me. Well said, well said. Are we going to get to 1919 at all, Jim, before we run out of time? I was going to go there next. Let's go. <laughs> so um, here, here's my question that as I, because we just read George Knight's book, um, Ellen White's Afterlife here recently. for. Oh, our yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what hit me as I went back and was reading the manuscript that was found uh, was the question that, do you think that the 1919 agenda asking A.G. Daniels to talk about it was a setup by the fundamentalists so they could kick him out and anybody else that was on that mindset? Because very shortly afterwards, they are all gone. Jim, just one minute, please uh, give, give everybody a background. One minute, the context for so 1919. I, 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 okay, I'll give it, I'll let my The lost documents and all of that. Just one minute so everyone knows what I want to hear Jim say it. <laughs> all right, so 1919 manuscript was a verbatim uh, account of discussions with A.G. Daniels and other church luminaries about how they saw the spirit of prophecy actually working. And they did not, subscribe to a verbal inspiration of her writings mm -hmm. whereas other people in the audience clearly did and ag daniels did not back off from that perspective and came out very clearly as did a number of others and very shortly thereafter all those leaders are out of office uh reduced to minor positions they're not fired, they're just demoted. And right? the documents were lost for what, 50 years? The documents were shelled until the 70s. And right. what really troubled me was I go to a seminary in the late 70s, the documents have already been found and my seminary class says not a thing about this document. And I go, wow. Why didn't they talk about that when I was in seminary and raise the issues? Well, it took, it took spectrum to bring them out. Okay, so Michael, that's my- Yeah, so that's probably one of the most famous things Spectrum's ever done, right? Is uh, publishing those excerpts. And uh, when they were discovered in the um, general conference in the basement, because there's just tons of boxes in the basement, nobody knew what the stuff was. And then they said, you know, we should have an archive. They start sorting through it and they say, you know what? There's actually something pretty significant here. <laughs> I actually interviewed Don Yost, the late Don Yost, who actually uh, found those transcripts. And he told me the story of how that all ha took place. Uh, well, I, I don't see it as a setup, Jim. I see this, uh, the people that really fought hardest against Daniels uh, 
Um, and I, I have a whole chapter about uh, these sniping um, Adventists uh, like Claude Holmes and J.S. Washburn. They've been doing this and attacking Daniels before this. I think uh, Daniels really genuinely hoped that the 1919 Bible Conference would bring a great revival and usher in the Second Advent. He really believed that that's, that was his goal. And he hoped that he could educate the thought leaders of the church on these issues. And by uh, my take in 1919, kind of a simplified version is, is if I lock all the theologians that are disagreeing with one another and lock them into a room for six weeks, basically, that at the other end, we'll all be united, we'll agree on everything, and, and, and we'll finish the work and Jesus will come. I mean, that's kind of the tone of his opening address, his opening remarks at the 1919 Bible Conference, which, by the way, he also says that the 1919 Bible Conference was mirrored and modeled after these other fundamentalist prophecy conferences that were going on too at the same time. And keep in mind, this is just after World War I. So there's a lot of anxiety. There's all of this tension. There's the influenza pandemic, which incidentally, I thought was the most boring part of my dissertation. I thought this would never be useful. And then suddenly um, <laughs> COVID hits and um, who's written on, on the 1918 influenza pandemic? And I discover, well, actually, I'm, I'm kind of the expert on that. So I, I accidentally, I didn't even know. <laughs> so I'm writing all these articles. How did Adventists respond to the 1918 influenza pandemic? Which, um, incidentally, uh, was by printing diagrams encouraging Adventists to wear face masks and to shut down churches uh, and comply with the government and do everything they could to help mitigate the pandemic. So very, very interesting. I don't see anybody uh, complaining, <laughs> my church is shut down, or complaining about having to wear a face mask. You just see, <coughs> excuse me, the strong emphasis on cooperative uh, efforts to um, embrace the best of science and mitigating um, yeah, a terrible we're pandemic. Di we're, di we're digressing. Let's come back. To yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll come back to this. It's late for me now, so I'm getting tired. Yeah. But uh, but to uh, come back to uh, Daniels and the 1919 Bible Conference, he sees a vision of what's possible. And he especially wants to see the educators of the church. Because when he has these pivotal discussions, it's not with the main 1919 Bible Conference. Actually, that had stopped. It had, it had finished. It was with these kind of post meetings with just the Bible and history teachers. And they invited him back and say, you know, we heard you talk about Ellen White and your memories of Ellen White. We don't know all of what Daniel said because that part of the transcripts, it actually records. Elder Daniels asked us to stop transcribing and it stops. <laughs> so we don't know what he said, but whatever it was, it was enough that it piqued the interest of those Bible and history teachers. And they came back for what they called a round table discussion, basically this heart to heart with the church president. And uh, Daniels was always very progressive in terms of his views of inspiration. And, and that's where they say, you know, if we don't do a, start doing a better job educating the church, we're going to have a terrible price to pay in the future that we're going to really have some serious trouble. And those words seem rather ominous. Uh, in fact, I wrote a paper, I called it the haunting of Adventism, uh, that we're kind of haunted by those words. Because the yes. 20th century is the story of, of, of the fact that those words came true, right? Yes. Um, that we didn't do the job we should have done in educating the church. They knew it back then if things didn't change. Um, the one thing we know is that they voted a committee, said, you know, we'll establish a committee and uh, hopefully publish things and educate the church. We don't have any evidence that that committee ever met. So, I mean, that's always the peril of committees, right? You know, you can always vote that. The other thing they did that was kind of fun is they voted themselves to go on a tour next year, the following year for uh, a tour of the Holy Land of course, they didn't have any budget for that. It's just kind of wist wistful thinking. So it's kind of in that context that they're like, yeah, let's let's have a committee. Let's all go to the Holy Land next year. Who, who, any, are everybody okay with that? Everyone's, you know, I mean, it's like pastor's meetings, right? You know, um, how many of you guys want to go on a Reformation study tour next year? And all the pastors are going to raise their hands. And then yep. the treasurer says, um, wait a minute, we didn't vote this in XCOM. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. we got to have a budget before we can do this, so. Um, so the what ifs of history, Jim and Dan, what if more had been done? Could there have been more done? Or was the onslaught of fundamentalism so comprehensive, so pervasive, uh, 
that um, it really didn't matter? I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but what is clear is that fundamentalism was already before the 1919 Bible Conference becoming so influential, these fundamentalist authors so influential in Adventist circles that um, I'm basically making the case that, that Adventism developed its own unique variety of fundamentalism in the 1920s. Um, and where we differed were just two different kinds of Adventist fundamentalists, one that's a little more moderate and rejects inerrancy, another group that's very militant. And, uh, and so um, those two different kinds of Adventist fundamentalism. By the way, they had some profound implications for Adventism. Um, I talk about trying to make it practical. Uh, for race and gender. Uh, in 1910, there's about a thousand women in leadership and as pastors, evangelists, serving in quite a variety of roles. By 1930, there's basically none left. By 1910, the end of Ellen White's lifetime, you have a church, you have a lot of churches that are still quite socially progressive and integrated. Uh, by the 1920s, you have churches that um, some of these same people like Holmes and Washburn, especially Washburn, very, very racist. He's uh, writing about a black and white heaven, about segregation. Um, and you actually see, and this is probably one of the most startling things I found this last year. I have an article coming up uh, out um, in a few weeks uh, talking about this research. Um, just as in the fundamentalist movement, you have some that became very attracted to the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. You also have Adventists that are actually promoting the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, so you, again, race and gender, you see these reversals, early Adventism, socially progressive, very integrated in terms of race relations, in terms of being progressive, in terms of women. By 1930, um, Adventism has done a U-turn, major U-turn when it comes to both race and gender. So we talk about fundamentalism, how did it have practical implications? It did, how you interpreted the Bible mattered and people began to interpret it in a lens, a filter that excluded women and that promoted segregation. And that's one of the very practical effects of, of we can trace this historically. It's not like, oh, I think that. No, I can show you documents, <laughs> how they are arriving to these conclusions, and how they're doing this, using this proof text, this very rigid, militant way of selective read, selectively reading uh, inspired writings that they then justify the exclusion of women and justify the uh, segregation uh, between blacks and whites. And um, this is kind of um, probably, I think, one of the most startling things of Adventist fundamentalism from this time period that I hope that we can see just how uh, profound uh, that impact had on the church. Um, and, and, and that's a very, that's, that's very, I'm trying to make it really, very real here, very practical. We're still struggling with race and gender, right? In the church, and you guys already mentioned the women's ordination debate, all these things, yeah, the personalities have changed and the specific issues have changed, but these underlying hermeneutics and how we interpret inspired writings, those kinds of, and of course it's become more complex over time too, right? Um, but, but these basic uh, challenges that we have and these, reversals um, that we can historically document. Um, how, how do we understand that? Why, why did these things happen? Well, I, um, obviously it's, it's, it's complex, but, but fundamentalism played a, uh, was a catalyst um, in facilitating uh, those reversals. Does that, and this gets into politics, does that explain anything as to why politics is being so invasive in ripping the church apart nowadays as the church seems to absorb the arguments from society around us in the US and it's just polarizing the church. Well, absolutely. I mean, we have to look and say, you know, is our faith informing our politics or is our politics informing our faith? Um, and so in the 1920s, we see uh, the rise of what we call Christian nationalism. That's in, in World War I and just afterwards is when Adventist churches start putting flags, American flags in, in American churches uh, to prove their loyalty, their nationalism and those kinds of things. Um, so we can document that. It's easier if we look back 100 years ago. It gets, you know, more, the closer it gets to the present, the more uncomfortable we become, right? And that's, that's what I love about history. You can look 100 years ago and, and we can look and see, oh, well, you know, what were Adventists thinking, you know, being 
uh, promoting the Ku Klux Klan, right? Uh, what were they thinking? Well, it was a, it was clearly um, a, an America first agenda. They, they would have, that's how they would have defined themselves, right? America first against immigration, against Catholics, for private education, uh, for Protestantism or historic Protestantism. Um, and, and so it's, it's really uh, an era of the rise of Christian nationalism. Um, and these are issues we're still struggling with today, as, as you're trying to point out. Um, and so that's why I keep coming back to you. Our faith must inform our politics and not the other way around. Dan? I guess uh, I'd be disappointed if we didn't at least try to get uh, maybe one minute answers on a couple of questions. Okay, uh, I'll try to keep it short. Having, having wrestled with the 1919 papers, uh, what is your answer to uh, Ellen White being inspired but still using secretaries and people who gave her suggestions on how to change dates and make the history accurate and so on and so on? What's a short yeah. answer to that? <laughs> the short answer is people oh, yeah. like Daniels and Ellen White that knew her knew that she had a flexible understanding of inspiration. She would see things and she'd write them out to the best of her ability. And she used sources, historians. She's never claimed to be a historian. But what was important wasn't the specific historic details on what date it happened or whether there were the famous thing in the French Revolution, whether or St. Bartholomew's Massacre, were there clouds in the sky or not. I think Ellen White really didn't care. She just used whatever historical source she had available, the best available to her. And But she, what she was concerned about is the message of salvation, the message of the great controversy. What do we understand about that in light of these historic events, right? Um, and so um, she t had a very flexible view of inspiration and that if you have a flexible view of inspiration, uh, then her using sources is not a big deal. If you believe in inerrancy and infallibility, and she was sort of like a pipeline from heaven that she's just like a, 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 a typewriter, then um, the fact that she would use sources then becomes very troubling and problematic. And, and um, that's where we've developed, we've developed our own worst enemies in the 20th century. Our major critics are people that uh, initially had believed in inerrancy, kind of had a fundamentalist mindset and then discovered, oh, actually that's not really true and accurate historically. And then they flip flop from one extreme being very rigid and very you know, extreme on one end and they flip flop to the other and just reject her completely. And I think if we teach a balanced view of Ellen White and, and understand how she used sources, um, uh, you know, my students, you know, I'm teaching them this, they're like, oh, that's cool. That's so cool. She used sources, awesome. She plagiarized. <laughs> Even better. That's amazing, you know. Uh, well, Dennis Fortin, I think, uh, read a paper where he gave as a lecture at the beginning of the yeah. uh, ASRS convention or somewhere. Right. Basically, yeah, yeah. Uh, making the case that that you know it, it was a fork in the road, and what we have had to do in the last 20, 30 years to reset our understanding of Ellen White could have happened sure. in the twenties. And could perhaps have. we could have been more balanced. We could have recalibrated that. And maybe we could have avoided these extremes and these pendulum swings. Uh, what do you think about that? You Is know, that historians don't like the what ifs of history because there's so many, that's contingency, right? That, that there's um, variables in different ways that, you know, you look at God's people in ancient Israel at times of where they struggled and times that they, celebrated right and um, good times and bad times and the decisions we make have very real consequences and and the theology that we believe has very practical and important consequences for how we live out our christian life good theology matters it matters a great deal and so um yeah so how we understand inspired writings matters how we interpret ellen white matters a great deal for a lot of for a lot of people and, um, and that's what we see in 1919. Yes, we can go back and wish they had done more, um, but they were creatures of their time. They were shaped by their world around them, the circumstances. Um, I'm not convinced that, that necessarily if they had all agreed and said, we're gonna go on a campaign you know, and educate the church, well, maybe it might've worked, but um, when you look, you know, they still saw themselves as fundamentalists. They just recognized that inerrancy was the issue. So it's almost like a tidal wave of fundamentalism just uh, deluges Adventism in the 1920s. So 
I don't know. It's it's I, it's one of those things that could be debated. I don't know that there's a, a good answer to that. But uh, are the, are the, 19, the literature 19, are the documents yeah, yeah. available to anybody who wants to read them now? Absolutely, and that's one of the great things. It's all digitized, uh, all two thousand some pages. Um, if you exclude the duplicate materials, it's about thirteen hundred pages. They're the General Conference Archives webpage, and you can. Uh, read to your heart's content the whole thing. The How whole could a thing. person get there if they wanted to? Uh, just go to AdventistArchives.org, AdventistArchives.org, and then just do a little search uh, for 1919 uh, minutes, and you should be able to easily pull those up, or just Google it. Um, it no I, one has I written my the, students. No one has written a Cliff Notes version of the really juicy, most relevant uh, comments. Well, I mean, the, the stuff that's most famous is what Jim mentioned was uh, later published in uh, Spectrum the, at the very end. But I would argue that, you know, there's earlier conversations about Ellen White that are also equally important. Um, someday, when I have enough time, uh, I would like to produce a annotated or scholarly edition of the most important parts of the transcripts. But I yeah. still have about a dozen other books I want to write before I get there. You need, uh, you need a room of secretaries and researchers to help you. Well, I'm trying to do my best. Uh, I keep trying to churn out books, but I can never, never catch up to George Knight because he keeps writing them too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think there's been progress. I think in, in my lifetime, every time I read the quarterly, I think about the day when, you know, all there was was a Bible verse at the top of the page and Ellen White quotes for the rest of the sure. page, every page. And now mm -hmm. we have Friday has two or three quotes from Ellen White. I love them. I love Ellen White's writings, but we have recalibrated our, mm -hmm. our, our relationship there with that. I, Absolutely. You know, I, I am a fan of Fred Bellman. I was in his classes and learned a oh, lot. Yeah. I've, I've been in the room where he had all that research going on. So I'm thankful for those people that have uh, taken stands and done research and uh, even even the difficult people, the Walter Rays and the others who maybe didn't handle it well, but at least brought some challenging questions to the church. So and you asked uh, about plagiarism. I, one more thing I want to point out, because I've been teaching and I have students that actually really do plagiarize and turn in assignments and I have to fail them. And we have a secret weapon. Teachers have a secret weapon today. It's called turn it in. So they have to upload their papers to, to whatever software we use canvas at southwestern and and turn it in has a stoplight system green yellow red green light don't worry about it yellow check it red it's really bad and anything less than um basically 30 percent, i think it is um because everybody's using sources all the time right so it's checking the internet for all these sources it's less than 30 percent. you can see an originality of ideas that the student is actually really trying. Even if they maybe miss a quotation mark, you can see there's an intentionality that they're molding the material, right? So it's a green light. 30 to 50%, it's a yellow light. Sometimes they plagiarize, sometimes they don't. I have to look at it and give a careful look. And um, if it's over 50%, you see uh, that every single time I've had to fail a student, they're in my office, there's tears, they're crying, I'm crying, it's a, it's a tragic thing. And, um, you know, I, I hate that. And uh, if you stack Ellen White, all that research with Fred Feltman and all the others, and now everything's digitized, um, stack it up. Um, most of her books fall somewhere in 10 to 20%. I think the highest is like 22, 23% at most. Um, even by turn it in standards today, based on all this great scholarship and research we've been able to do, Ellen White, we, we, we held her to the same standard that I hold my college students to. Right? That's, a, that's a great point. Uh, they, they, Ellen White, um, and, and Denis Fortin in his Ellen White Encyclopedia article, he makes the point that Ellen White was always the master of her sources, never the slave of her sources. And I think that's that's really the important thing to point out. The the real issue why in why why using sources is a problem is for people that come from this inerrantist, extreme, rigid militant fundamentalist mindset and if you come from that mindset uh, and have that view of inspiration um, and then you discover she used even one percent from somebody else it's utterly and completely devastating Michael, and that's that's the problem take what you just said speak into a microphone on your way to the airport tomorrow send that to the review 
and get that article out, uh, that'd be helpful. That's a helpful corrective. And it's practical and it's warm and it's personal and it clarifies the issue. Uh, yeah, we all use turned it in here too. And that's a great, right. great balance on that. Yeah. I've had to deal with hard kids. Kids come from another country, another culture. That is not the standard. And I said, dude, we're giving you a last year degree that says you can do this and you didn't. And what do we do with that? Great stuff. I, I am great. But Jim, uh, take it back here. But thank you for clarifying some of those some of those issues well our time is up and so michael what would you like to say wrapping it up in terms of what god has led you to or where you think god is leading to you to next you can go yeah Jim, I, I, you know no, no. you know you know we're in the midst of a transition uh to, to head up a new department of research at the north american division um, i love teaching love the classroom but also want to look at ways that we can synergistically um, and collaborate with uh, scholars at all of our colleges and universities across the North American division to create more resources for our church, uh, both scholarly resources as well as popular resources. And if we can do that um, and educate the church, we want to do what didn't happen in 1919 and take the best of Adventist scholarship and make it accessible for the, for the church uh, member in the pew. And that's my dream. That's my goal. It's not something I will do by myself, but I do hope that to help facilitate and be a part of helping to make those kinds of things happen. So pray for me. That's kind of the burden of my heart. I want to keep writing, doing some of my own research, just finishing up 1922 been working on um, several other writing projects that uh, probably the most significant is the Oxford Handbook of Seventh-day Adventism. We're in the final stages of that. We expect to have that out. Um, it has to go through all the editorial processes at Oxford once we're done with it. Uh, but it should be out within the next year, and that uh, will be the first major reference work about Seventh-day Adventism by a group of scholars, about 40 chapters, um, and we wanted to create a resource that would be accessible for, especially for non-Adventists, published by a top academic university press, um, and put a copy of that, get a copy of that hopefully in every academic library of the world. And so I'm excited. That's uh, It's been like a five-year project. And uh, it's been a labor of love, but I'm, I'm just delighted that we're, we've had a great team, great scholars um, that have invested a lot of time and effort. And this will truly be, I think, a uh, significant resource uh, for our world church. So that's kind of what I've been up to and a little bit of a sneak preview of what I hope will be coming around the corner. All right, Dan, why don't you, Dan, why don't you close with prayer for us? Appreciate it, Michael. Appreciate it. God bless you in your new role. Thanks for having me. Our dear Father in heaven, I uh, give thanks for for the balance and the the depth and the maturity of what we have discussed tonight and what we have heard. I thank you that you have obviously uh, uh, guided and cultured this man to to uh, to find a balanced approach, to be honest, to be deeply spiritual, practical to deal honestly with evidence and find nuanced and balanced ways to deal with things that have often been polarizing. I pray an anointing blessing upon him as he goes to the NAD, that he will keep that center and that he will continue to be productive and maybe have resources that would be brought to him that would allow him to truly uh, bless the church with the judgment and the balance and uh, nuances that he has has studied and seems to gravitate to. I thank you for his respect for scripture. And we pray, Father, that uh, that those perspectives will become the brand of the Adventist church, reasonable and Christ-centered and honest with scripture and with our message from Ellen White. And that message together with the uh, evangelists and wisdom and passion of all the others, that somehow everything that we do around the world will be guided by this kind of centeredness. And uh, we will be ready to move truly into the last days. So bless him, Father. May he know that he is uh, doing your will and that uh, we are cheering him on. And at the end uh, of the run, he will look back and know that you have guided every step. And he has, like Jesus, spoken only the words that God has wanted him to speak. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, just really quick, uh, for those listening, my 1922 book, and The Rise of Adventist Fundamentalism, available from Pacific Press, coming to an ABC near you in May, also available on Kindle. So that's if someone's listening and they say, you know, how do I find this? Um, uh, that's, that's how you can access uh, the, this new book coming out. And then what was the title of the 1919 book again? 1919 and the untold story of Adventism's struggle with fundamentalism. So, so 1922 is the rise of Adventist fundamentalism. And then my third installment, which will be coming out. Now I've got to take the, now I got to take the, sorry about that. Now I got to take the, um, uh, uh, the third installment will be 1925, looking at the Scopes trial and the paradox of uh, last generation theology. How did last generation theology? We talked a little bit about that, but I'm going to go into quite a bit more depth and in documenting that historically.